All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about the fading American dream and computer, what computer science has to do with it, how it could be part of the solution, but right now it's part of the problem, and finally what I'm trying to do to make it go from being part of the problem to part of the solution. So there's been a lot of talk in recent years about the, uh, the growing income distribution gap, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, and I think some people might say, well, that's okay, if you work really hard, then you deserve to be getting more and more of the money. And those who don't work hard, if they're getting less, then too bad. But I'm gonna uh, give you, I don't think that's what's happening. And I think we have some compelling evidence that says that uh, the world is getting less and less fair. For the argument of, well, maybe they just weren't working that hard, if you look at graduate degrees, more and more people with not just bachelor's degrees, but graduate degrees are finding themselves needing government assistance. From 2007 to 2010, the number of people with master's degrees doubled, and the number with doctorates tripled on the number of people who needed government assistance. Okay. Well, that's okay. Well, maybe they just made the wrong decisions. Maybe they just chose the wrong field. Right? They had all the equal opportunity, and they just made poor decisions. But the inequity starts very early. Uh, a study was done on 42 families uh, in Kansas, and they were trying to figure out why it was that when they had had an event intervention in preschool, uh, the intervention didn't last. So they would get these kids from low-income families, and they would teach them new vocabulary, do all these educational games, and it would work really well while the kids were there. But by the next year, when they were in kindergarten, it was back to as if they had never gone to the special preschool program. And what they found, so they went into the homes, and what they found was that for children of parents with welfare, by the time the children were three years old, they had heard 30 million fewer words than children of professional parents. That was one-fourth as many words. And that's not unique words, but just the amount of time that the parents had to talk to the children and to read to their children was so different. And then furthermore, what they found was that the vocabularies were very different. So in, uh, in professional families, the vocabulary of a three-year-old was over a thousand words, and in children, the children with families of welfare, it was under 600 words. Okay? Well, that's just in preschool, right? Does that really carry through? Well, they did find that. There was actually a follow-up study uh, when the children were nine years old of the same families, and they found that the, the vocabulary at age three correlated very well with the test scores at age nine. And a lot of other studies have found that reading comprehension is the biggest, biggest predictor of performance in math, not just language arts. So all of these things start very early, the inequities in America. Okay. And I think, uh, I think recent events have made it more clear that it's not just academic performance and home life in the US that's different for what, whether you're a different ethnicity or a different gender. People treat you differently based on what you look like. Uh, and it's, it's systemic injustices. It's not just life and death like things that we've seen, but it's small things that happen every day that eat away at people's self-esteem, eat away at the choices that they have. All right. So that sounds pretty bad. <laughs> Where does computing come into this? Why, why am I a computer science professor trying to talk to you about uh, social injustice as well? Uh, computing is, could be a big part of the solution. Computing jobs, there's a lot of talk about STEM jobs. And everyone should go into STEM. But it turns out that if you look at STEM jobs, most of the growth in STEM jobs is actually in computing jobs. And they're not just any jobs. They're good jobs. Okay. Uh, so these are the top. 16 jobs that were rated by uh, CNN. And we can see that computing jobs, I actually don't know what online employee means, but it's clearly computing in some way. Online employee was the top job. And these two numbers, the number on the left is the median salary, and the number on the right is the top pay. So we see that the number one job was computing, the number five job, IT project manager, the number eight job, computer network security consultant, the number 12 job, software developer, and the number 16 job, software product manager. Okay? So computing jobs, if we could get lots of people in trained for computing jobs, maybe we could take a stab at making America a more equal place. Now, is that what's happening? Is computer science currently part of the solution? No. Unfortunately, it's not. So what this graph shows is STEM, STEM careers, 1966 through 2010, and it shows the percentage of women who earn bachelor's degrees. And you can see that, in general, almost all of these lines are increasing from left to right. Okay? But we see one line that's not. It goes up for 20 years, 
And then around 1984, it starts going down. And it keeps going down and going down. And it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, let's see, we had the tech, the tech craze, and then it went down some more. Okay? And this is the computer science line. It's the only line in all of the STEM fields where women were doing pretty well and now have very poor representation. Okay? Now let's look at ethnicity. If we look at the ethnic representation of students getting bachelor's degrees in computer science, computing, not just computer science, but computer science, computer engineering, uh, informatics, and then the total in computing, we can see that it's dominated by uh, whites and Asians. Okay? Well, how does this compare to their population in the country? What I did was I graphed it by a ratio of the number of bachelor's degrees divided by the population. So anything over one, would be overrepresentation, and anything under one would be underrepresentation. So we can see that Asians are overrepresented in computer science compared to their general population, even though uh, the total percentage in computing is not that high. Uh, and then, strangely enough, uh, native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are slightly overrepresented. Uh, and then whites are slightly underrepresented, but we can see that American Indians uh, and Native Americans uh, African Americans and Hispanics are far underrepresented in computing. Now, I'm not the only one to figure this out. There's been a lot of movement recently in K-12 computer science education research. So Code.org has this whole new campaign to try to get girls interested in computer science. The NSF has, fun has been funding for years initiatives to try to, to broaden participation in computing and do research in CS education. Code.org has um, just released a curriculum targeted at teachers who don't know computing in order to try to allow them to teach computing in, a, in any classroom across the US. And Scratch Junior has just been released as a, a computing development platform for kindergarten through third grade. So there's been a lot of movement in this area. But has it been working? What, what's happening now? Well, if we look at K-12, uh, it's whatever we're doing now is definitely not working. So what this chart shows you is that on the left-hand side, we see the ethnicities and uh, um, gender representation of high school students in California. But we can see that in California, 50% of the population is Latinos, 7% African American, uh, and females represent, make up 49% of the students. But if you look at who's taking the APCS exam, uh, we can see that only 21% of females are taking it and only 7% Latino and 1% African American. And there have been a lot of studies on why this is, and that's because many, many high schools, the high schools that a lot of Latinos and African Americans attend, don't have computing curricula at all. So by going into the K-12 space, what's happening is instead of being an equalizing force, it's actually creating more inequity because the high schools that have the curriculum given an, an advantage to the students who are there, who are the same people who already have an advantage in computing. Okay. So what am I doing? I'm trying to change this. I want computer science not to be part of the problem. I want it to be part of the solution. So I'm targeting fourth through sixth grade. Because in fourth through sixth grade, it's not an elective. It's not some, something that a very small subset of students choose because of whether they feel like they might be a computer scientist or look what they think of a computer science looking like. Uh, and so it wouldn't be an elective. And all these students would see that everyone can do it. I mean, it's, there's nothing special about it being in computing. Anyone can be in computer science. Uh, and the other thing is that there are flexible school schedules. So by the time you get to middle school, if you're going to do a subject, it has to be an hour a day. Whereas when you're in elementary school, we can just do an hour a week. Okay. Uh, the other reasons are because career interests form early. Uh, research has shown that the career interests students have in fifth and sixth grade, if they didn't think they, of themselves as potentially becoming a scientist, they're very unlikely to become a scientist. So what you think of when you're very young actually has a big influence on what you become later in life. Uh, and also, the, the courses you take in eighth grade are the biggest predictor of whether or not you'll attend college at all. And so it's important that we expose students to things early so that they can decide to take the right classes so that they can be college ready. The problem is that we don't really know how to do computer science in K through six or fourth through sixth grade where I'm aiming. Because we don't even know, well, how does that relate to what they're already doing? I mean, can they do full-fledged programs as fourth graders? Well, some can, sure. But if we're talking about getting into the normal classroom, we have to look at what everybody can do, not just what one person can do or three out of 30. And so we have to really understand how computer science fits into the developmental uh, level of the students. 
there are also a lot fewer resources. We don't really know what the language should look like, what the programming environment should look like, and what the curriculum should look like. And possibly the hardest problem is that the teachers are not specialized. And so what we're saying is we're saying that your elementary school teacher with absolutely no computer science background should be expected to teach children some level of computer science. And that's a little scary for them. Right? And so we want to provide something that, student, that teachers can be confident in teaching. Okay? So two of the research questions I've been looking at are how should we teach computing in a way that engages the students, that makes them want to, to pursue computing careers? And what content should we teach at the grade level? How do we figure out what's appropriate at a certain grade level? So my first project in this area was called Animal Sotoke, and it was an interdisciplinary summer camp. So we combined animal conservation, Mayan culture, stor storytelling, and art, and of course computer science. Uh, for those of you who are computer scientists, you might notice the binary tree that I have displayed. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. um, and so what we, our goal wasn't actually to teach computer science. It was just to change the attitudes of the students to so we did teach computer science, but it was to get them interested in computing. And so, and to attract students that don't normally go to computer science. We didn't want to make a camp that we would have gone to because we were already computer scientists, so we're clearly not the target demographic. And so we took the themes to try to attract students to our camp, and it worked. You can see, so these uh, three bars, the blue bar is females. The red bar is Latinos, so you can also have someone who's both female and Latino, so those don't necessarily add up to 100%. And then the third bar are any students who are neither uh, ethnic minorities nor female, so those are males, Caucasian, or, or Asian. And what we found was that, and by the way, we did not discriminate after the applications got to us. All we did was choose the themes and do targeted mailings. Uh, and what we found was that uh, in the end, after three years, almost 70% of the students were female, almost 50% of the students were uh, Latino, and fewer than 10% of the students were underrepresented minorities. All right, but okay, so we got them in the door, but did we change attitudes at all? Uh, so what this shows, the blue is the pre-survey interest in computing as careers, uh, and the Red is post-interest. So the first thing we look at is boys versus girls. So we can see that when students came, it turned out that girls had a lot less interest in computer science than boys did, which, is, which matches what we would have thought. Uh, but by the end of the camp, you can see that the difference in the girls was very high. So by the end of the camp, the girls were much more interested in computer science. If we divide it just by all of the students who had no interest in computer science at the beginning versus students who did have interest in computer science at the beginning, um, we can see that of the students who were interested in the computer science activities, not surprisingly, they were much more likely to be interested in computer science as a career than those not interested in computer science activities. Uh, but once again, we were happy that by the end of the camp, over 40% of those students who had started out having no interest in computer science activities were actually interested in computer science. So what we showed was by integrating computer science into an engaging interdisciplinary camp, we can really get students to get excited about this. Unfortunately, it was really expensive and it took a lot of computer scientists, which is not going to be a successful model. So the next thing we did was look at how can we get it into the elementary schools. And to do that, we have to understand where students are developmentally and they don't have any computer science, but what other skills might they have that would be pre-skills to programming? And so what we looked at was something called, in a set of exercises called CS Unplugged. And what we did was we gave them some drawings, one at a time, and we had a student try to tell the other students how to draw the drawing. Because in computer science, programming is really about telling the computer how to do something. Uh, and so what we did was we started out with, with what's called a learning progression. So a learning progression is all the steps that you need to learn to, to learn something and they all build on, on another. And a lower anchor point is what people have before they see a curriculum. That's what we were trying to identify. What do students already know? And so what we said was, well, you know, a lot of kids have younger siblings or their friends have younger siblings. So maybe what they're able to do is create step-by-step -step instructions for an age-appropriate task for a child with less knowledge or vocabulary than they do, because that's what you would do if you taught your younger sibling how to tie their shoes or something. Um, and so that was our prediction. And so we did this exercise, and what we found was we were wrong. <laughs> what we found was, in fact, they were not, they were not able to 
uh, even create the step-by-step -step instructions for an age-appropriate task for a peer. And the task was trying to get them to draw that picture. And part of it's because so much precision was involved. When you're teaching your younger uh, sibling how to tie their shoe, you can actually show them. You're not restricted to just words. And so restricting it to just words was a very big barrier. So that was also not a lower anchor point, but it's of course something you would need to be able to do before you could do the other one. So we did find two lower anchor points, which were promising. One is that they're really good at critiquing one another's instructions. I'm sure you're all surprised by that. Um, you don't love critiquing each other's work at all, or the instructor. Uh, and, and the other thing that was nice was they, they did recognize the need for precise instructions. So uh, they had some understanding of the computer and that you would need to be precise. So those were the lower anchor points. So, so what we thought was going to be sort of an introductory uh, exercise, fun exercise to get students ready to do programming, actually became an instructional exercise. And we actually changed it in our curriculum to teach the students how to create step-by-step -step instructions as opposed to just having them do it as an exercise and then move on. Okay. All right, so what are we going to do in the future? Well, there are two big things that need to be done in order to make this really viable for a K-6 curriculum. Uh, one is to map out the rest of those learning progressions for K-6. That was just at fourth grade. But what, what are the the pre-skills that one might have in first grade that would, could be taught that would later lead to doing better in computing? Uh, what should be taught at each grade level? And how can we integrate those with the existing curriculum? And then on the other side, we need to actually create resources. Once we know that uh, learning progression, then we need to create curricula, we need to create programming languages, we need to create uh, development environments, off the computer activities that can be used in a classroom by a teacher who's not a computer science expert uh, to teach students computer science.